In a prior video, we talked about some of the times when a gimmick change helped to take someone's career to the next level. Sadly though, this isn't always the case. No, from time to time a fresh coat of paint will turn out to be a bad thing, as it ends up making them worse off than they started. But what are some of the biggest examples of this? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into Two Steps Back, Wrestling's Downgraded Gimmicks. And if we're going to start anywhere, let's start with one of the more recent examples of this phenomenon happening, because it was only in 2022 that L.A. Knight became Max Dupree. Ah, L.A. Knight. What a great talker this guy is. It's been said before by others, of course, but it really bears saying again, he's basically what happens if you mix the promo styles of Steve Austin and The Rock and place them right in modern-day WWE. And it was these very skills which made him such a big hit on the indie circuit during the 2010s, where he went by the name of Eli Drake. That said, this name would be resigned to history once he joined WWE in 2021 and was there rebranded as L.A. Knight. Yeah! Sure, it was a bit of a jarring new moniker, and one which took a bit of getting used to at first, as for many 90s kids, it immediately made them think of light-up sneakers. But with the power of his promo skills, after a while, L.A. Knight started to sound normal, and the man behind the gimmick began getting over big time on the black and gold brand. Hell, so successful would he be, at one point he'd even defeat Cameron Grimes to become the million dollar champion. The only question left then was, how would he fare once he hit the main roster? Well, that's a complicated question because while you might argue that Maximum Male Models is one of the most legitimately funny gimmicks in wrestling today, the rebranding of L.A. Knight to Max Dupree certainly wasn't necessary to making this work. No, all that did was water down someone who was going through his second name change in as many years. And on top of that, with his protégés Massey and Mansois being very much in the comedy category, it meant Max Dupree was limited in what he was able to get across in his promos, and as such, wasn't allowed to blossom into the top-level act he could have been. Luckily though, since Triple H's takeover of creative, the Maryland native has returned to his prior gimmick of L.A. Knight, so hopefully he'll now get a much-deserved push in the near future. Yes, it seems to have turned out all right in the long run for him. It's just a shame our next entry hasn't been able to get back on track after his dead-on-arrival gimmick then, because when it comes to Shanky, he's fallen hard ever since being saddled with the dreaded dancing giant role. Of course, this is something many giants in wrestling have had to deal with before. After all, once they've been beaten and fans realize they're not invincible, there's often nowhere else to go. It's happened to the great Kali, just as it's happened to the Big Show and Kurrigan and Albert and almost every other big man who stepped through the doors of WWE at some point. So in that sense, maybe Shanky's fate shouldn't come as a surprise, but that doesn't make it suck any less for him because after less than two years on the roster, he's already been reduced to the role of comedy figure, with this being something he'll likely never recover from. Hell, at least in the case of folks like Kali, they got to have big main event runs before they became throwaway goofs. Not for Shanky, however, as in May of 2022, he started doing what we all knew was coming sooner or later when his dancing shoes were put on and he began moving to the beat. And as far as we know, he's still doing that. Not that we can say this for certain, though, because ever since Triple H took over as head of creative in the summer of that same year, Shanky's been missing in action. Is this a sign the game is hoping to bring him back at some point in a more traditional heel role, or is it just a sign he also doesn't know what to do with the giant? We can't be sure, but either way, it might not matter because with rumors abound more and more every day that Vince McMahon is slowly taking up the reins of creative once more, we wouldn't be surprised to see the big man back on our screens before the year is out, moving and grooving exactly as his boss desires. Yes, it's not something most are looking forward to, but it seems inevitable. So the quicker we can all accept it, the less painful it'll be when it comes. The only hope we can have for Shanky in specific is that his dancing gimmick won't be quite as bad as Brodus Clay's when he morphed into the Funkasaurus in 2012. That's right, another victim of the dancing big man curse, Brodus had a promising career cut off at the knees when, in the early 2010s, the boss decided he needed a little more character to get him over. So after thinking long and hard about what this new direction could be for the man who'd up until then been portrayed as a no-nonsense bodyguard of Alberto Del Rio, Vince McMahon settled on the unique option of having him dance. 
And that's how we got the Funkasaurus, a b-boy inspired gimmick which saw Clay shimmy his way down to the ring each and every week, all to the tune of Ernest the Cat Miller's old theme, Somebody Call My Mama. Of course, it wasn't just the Funkasaurus who was doing the dancing though, because by his side each time were his Funkadactyls, Naomi and Cameron. Yes, perhaps the most notable thing about this awful character in hindsight is that it introduced audiences to two-time women's champion and Anawaii family member Trinity Fatu. At that point, however, such a fact did little to make up for audiences being forced to watch Brodus Clay poorly dance and proclaim himself to be from Planet Funk every week. No, all it did instead was turn him into a joke, one who would never be treated seriously as a main eventer in New York. So perhaps it's unsurprising that in the years since, Clay has left WWE and instead moved over to the NWA, where he became their world's champion. But going elsewhere and winning a top prize there isn't an option everyone has available to them after undergoing a bad gimmick change. No, sometimes once you get struck down with something like this, it can be hard to ever recover, as was the case with Mike Awesome when he became that 70s guy in 2000. And what made this one even worse is that it wasn't even the first terrible gimmick change Awesome had undergone while working for the Vince Russo-led World Championship Wrestling. No, prior to this, he'd also gone by the moniker of the Fat Chick Thriller, someone who had a penchant for ladies of the larger variety. So maybe by comparison, that 70s guy shouldn't seem so bad then, but somehow it still feels even worse. After all, during his time in Extreme Championship Wrestling, Awesome had been an absolute killer, someone who destroyed absolutely everyone he came up against to the point that he was a two-time ECW World Champion. And that's not even mentioning the series of classic bouts he had with Masato Tanaka, bouts which were so hard-hitting they would have made the likes of Mitsuharu Misawa and Toshiaki Kawada over in All Japan Pro Wrestling blush. Ultimately though, WCW fans never got the chance to see this side to Awesome because instead, after his career killer role as the fat chick thriller ended, the Florida native fell even harder when he was basically asked to start playing a guy who was so infatuated with the 70s he'd drive a Partridge Family style bus around to shows, then host special interview segments directly from his lava lamp lounge. Really, it's not hard to see why this one failed to get him over as it was pretty bad from the offset, so bad in fact that it would have been dropped altogether as Awesome instead morphed into the somewhat better Canadian career killer during his feud with Team Canada. Not that this could repair all the damage done though. No, things were too far gone for that by then. Just as things were too far gone for Leo Kruger after he spent a period in the mid-2010s as Adam Rose. Yes, there have been a lot of great Adams in wrestling history. Adam Copeland, Adam Page, and Adam Cole, baby, are three who come to mind right away, in fact. But one who certainly hasn't earned a spot on that list is Adam Rose, because when he first appeared in NXT in 2014 as a rebranding of Raymond LePon's old character Leo Kruger, it was clear pretty quickly that this one had a very definitive ceiling on it. Why was that? Well, the Party Boy gimmick, which was reportedly based on Russell Brand, certainly had a spot in the comedy undercard, especially as Rose would regularly be accompanied down to the ring by his Rosebuds. That said, it wasn't exactly something you could see in the main event of WrestleMania, and sure, maybe Leo Kruger would never have reached such a role either, but he certainly would have had a better chance because when treated like a serious threat, he was able to become the FCW Florida Heavyweight Champion on two separate occasions down on the pre-NXT developmental brand. Once he morphed into the Eternal Party Animal, however, any possibility of success on the main roster was gone in an instant. And this was only proven when he finally moved up to Raw later in 2014 and was there pretty quickly relegated to playing second fiddle for someone in a bunny costume. In fact, so bad was this gimmick at turning Kruger into a star, the most memorable thing about it now is how many of his rosebuds have since gone on to have greater success of their own. Yes, whether it be Becky Lynch, Braun Strowman, or even Alexa Bliss, the number of world champions who once counted themselves as mere revelers to Adam Rose is so high, it must make him wonder what he was doing wrong in order to never reach the same level himself. Not that this was his fault, however. No, he did the best he could with what he had to work with, just as another of his former Rosebuds did the best she could years later when, after spending a period as WWE's resident Scottish lunatic, Nikki Cross tried to be something a little more inspirational when she started portraying the role of Nikki A.S.H. Yes, rather than having Cross play something which allowed her to be a serious threat in a world title contender, Cross instead morphed into a woman who wanted to be a superhero. 
Of course, she wasn't quite good enough to be an actual superhero though, and after losing most of her matches, she resigned herself to the fact that she still had some work to do. And this made her A.S.H., almost a superhero. Something which was designed to be inspirational for kids watching, but in reality, only served to make Cross seem altogether inadequate. After all, if she, a WWE superstar, wasn't good enough to be a superhero, then what hope did any kids watching have? No, while this had the potential to be a modern-day version of the Hurricane, the decision to portray Nikki as largely still someone who lost most of her matches in spite of her gimmick change meant it never really got out of first gear. And that was why, even when she cashed in her Money in the Bank contract and won the Raw Women's title from Charlotte Flair in July of 2021, few people treated her seriously as a top act, because up until then, she hadn't been treated like one. Hell, it's likely what led to her dropping the belt right back to the Queen a few weeks later, as from there, she was once again relegated to the mid-card. That was until Triple H took over in the summer of 2022 and allowed Cross to return to her old gimmick once more, of course. And it's just as well he did this, because while she's still trying to repair some of the damage, Nikki is in a far better position now, even if she no longer has the Raw Women's title around her waist. Yes, Triple H has undoubtedly done a lot of good since becoming the new head of creative, but even he doesn't have a perfect track record when it comes to gimmick changes, as along with Shawn Michaels, the new boss of NXT, the two have really managed to do a number on Reggie by sending him back to the developmental brand and morphing him into scripts. And sure, Reggie was never going to be a main event player, as his skill was always more in the mid-card, where his parkour abilities saw him get into intergender feuds with the likes of Sasha Banks and Dana Brooke. But at least this was something of a role for him on the show, and one which didn't make him look like a complete fool. No, that wouldn't happen until after being removed from TV for a while, and in mid-2022, he'd make his NXT debut under the new name of Scripts. And who was Scripts? Well, he was basically a guy in a bad Halloween mask who looked so wacky, fans couldn't help but laugh at him when they first saw him. Seriously, his ill-fitting face covering and orange and black bodysuit looked so low rent, it's amazing a company as big as WWE would allow something like that on their TV. And this has meant that rather than being treated like the serious heel he was supposed to be during those initial promo packages, Scripps instead has become little more than a punchline used by people to lament how far NXT has fallen since the glory days of the black and gold brand. Maybe Scripps will just have to accept his fate then and settle for being a modern day version of the Shockmaster, a gimmick so wildly mocked that it'll surely make him a killing on the convention circuit one day if he can keep a hold of the mask until then. Yes, even if your career is derailed by a bad gimmick, there's always future meet and greets to fall back on for the worst of the worst out there. And that's because, as history has shown, people tend to have a soft spot for awful characters from prior generations once some distance has been put between them and the present. And if you need any evidence of that, you only need to look at Smash of Demolition's notoriously terrible follow-up, The Repo Man. And even if there's a section of the fan base who has nostalgia for this one, it doesn't change the fact that it was a pretty big downgrade from Barry Darso's prior gimmick, where he played one-third of the hugely successful Demolition. And well, sure, at least initially, part of the team's success had been on account of their similarities to the Road Warriors, after a while, Axe and Smash were able to create something unique of their own. Something which became such a hit with audiences, it eventually led to a third member being introduced in the form of Crush. That said, once Crush went solo and Axe largely retired from in-ring competition in 1991, Smash was left with the question as to what to do next. And unluckily for him, Vince McMahon had some ideas about this as well, ideas which led to him morphing into a villainous Repo Man who liked to steal the belongings of other superstars when they apparently didn't make their repayments on time. But that wasn't even the worst of the gimmick, because for some reason, rather than dress in a suit and a tie like most real-life Repo Men would, Darso instead adorned himself in a grey one-piece with tire marks on it, which gave the impression he'd been run over while trying to repossess something. Then, as if that wasn't bad enough, there was his Lone Ranger-style domino mask, which made him look like something out of a 1930s comic strip. So it's no surprise that this gimmick didn't last long then, as by 1993, it would be dropped and Darso would instead move over to WCW, where he ran out the clock on his full-time in-ring career. Thankfully though, when he did, he was able to revert back to something a lot closer to his demolition character, with that being enough to get him over with fans in Atlanta for a while longer. 
And obviously our next subject was taking notes with this one, because when Elias was replaced by his twin brother Ezekiel in 2022, you could tell right away he was trying to think of any excuse he could to get back to his old gimmick. But then why wouldn't he, because up until then, Elias had gotten over with WWE fans in a big way as a mid-card act who could make fun of both babyfaces and heels alike with his personalized songs. Sure, once he actually had to hit the ring, it wasn't exactly a masterclass, but he served a purpose on the show nonetheless. Unfortunately though, after five years on the main roster, the act was in danger of growing stale, and so that was why, in one of his last acts as head of creative, Vince McMahon decided to change things up when he had Elias be written off of TV, only to then be immediately replaced by his up until now unseen twin brother Ezekiel. And yes, there were some fun moments which came out of this gimmick, such as when Kevin Owens got unreasonably upset at others' inability to figure out it was just Elias without his beard. But let's be honest, 95% of the reason that whole angle was entertaining was because of KO and his excellent comedy skills. Whenever he wasn't involved, however, things took a nosedive quickly as it became clear to fans everywhere this joke only had one note, and that note had been played to death. So Jeffrey Ciolo, the man behind the mask, must have been overjoyed when Triple H took over in July of that same year and quickly dropped the whole thing by bringing Elias back to TV instead. Sure, you could argue that the Drifter hasn't exactly been a blowaway success since then either, but at least he's not doing a role which only works if he's on the opposite side of the ring from Kevin Owens. And at least he's never had to do a role as bad as our next subject for today because back in 2008, Funaki was given an all-timer to work with when he was repackaged as Kung Funaki. Yeah, that's right, this actually happened. And while it's not as if WWE treated Kai and Tai in the best way during their early run in the Attitude Era, this one was on another level altogether. Let's just say Funaki deserved so much better if for no other reason than he was always one of the most underrated performers on the roster. And while he never really rose above mid-card level under Vince McMahon's watch, at least he was always dependable at filling whatever role was asked of him. That said, we're pretty sure when he got given the role of Kung Fu Naki, he probably wished he wasn't so versatile as this one was plain awful. What was it? Well, it basically was Funaki coming down to the ring in a full karate gi and imperial headband, complete with a theme song that was a complete ripoff of Kung Fu fighting. And this was also reflected in the way he wrestled too as it happened, as now no longer doing actual moves, the Tokyo native instead worked his bouts with a series of theatrical chops, thrusts, and even a crane kick. So needless to say, this one didn't go down well with fans, and perhaps it's a blessing in disguise then that come 2010, Funaki would be released from his contract and, in the process, released from having to play this character again. Of course, we bet more than a few of the performers we've discussed today could say the same thing too, because as we've learned today, sometimes change can be a bad thing.